close it with the X. Okay, so we're going to get started today on exercise 204, and we're actually breaking a little bit from working in Rhino to today we're going to concentrate on V-Ray. And so it's going to jump back and forth a little bit. So we'll do V-Ray and uh, today, and then we'll go back to Rhino for a couple more days, and then we'll go back to V-Ray, and then we'll do Rhino for a few more days, and then we'll go back to V-Ray. Um, V-Ray, it's kind of one of those interesting things. Like, there's a part of me that wants to save V-Ray to the end, and we just do a bunch of Rhino to get you up to speed in Rhino, and then uh, we'll do a bunch of V-Ray, and we'll be in the V-Ray mindset. But all too often, you guys want, at least in the beginning, to be able to put some materials on things and to make it look decent, as opposed to just being able to 3D model. So today, we're going to introduce the concept of materials and kind of basic settings in materials. Um, We'll also, you guys today, will download a material library so that you have a bunch of materials to work from. Uh, I'm in the process of updating some of the materials in it, so you may later in the semester need to re-download it, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, that, that material library you'll save on your flash drive, and you'll be able to use all of those materials as we go forward. But before we get to just automatically loading up a material, it's important to kind of go through what's happening in V-Ray and how do, the, how do we make these adjustments. Because the materials that you load up, somebody had to create in the first place. And yes, they tend to be the most common materials that you're going to use, but sometimes you need a material that just doesn't exist. You can't find it online. You need something to act like white plastic, for example. And you can't find a white plastic online with a certain texture. How do you make that? And so by the end of this class, you'll know how to make it. You'll be able to make anything uh, that you need if you can't find it. it. Obviously, it's easiest if you can find the material and you just load it up and don't worry about it. But uh, for our purposes today, we're going to go through kind of understanding the basics of material. But before we do uh, materials, we're going to start with part one and create just a composition of shapes. So I want you to create um, five objects. We can use just the preset objects that are available in the solids uh, menu over here. There's a cube, for example. So here's a box, corner to corner. There's a box. If we click and hold on it, there's other shapes. So we could, for example, create a cylinder. Make that a little bit taller. I'll put a wall at the back, so a long skinny box that's a little bit taller than the other boxes. And maybe, oh, let's do a pyramid. Sure, that sounds pretty good. Do a pyramid, and I don't know. Everybody likes a donut, right? You better. Right. So I'm just creating uh, five different objects. We're going to use these objects to interact. It doesn't matter what your objects are or what they look like. They just need to be five objects. Uh, you could do five boxes. That's just fine. Um, but I like to go through and create a variety of different, different shapes so you can see how the materials are going to apply to them. So the five objects should be relatively easy. There's, there's nothing special to them. I'm not even putting dimensions on them. Uh, but we're going to move from there into actually trying to set up some of the scene stuff. Yeah? No, no shapes in Rhino are actually solid. Um, these shapes are closed polysurfaces. They act like a solid. They would 3D print like a solid, but they're not in actually a solid. So if I were to zoom into this box, for example, as I zoom in, there would come a point where I was suddenly inside the box. Um, that's the way all shapes work in Rhino. So like 3D Studio, for example, you can actually create a solid. And it's, a, it's just it's a different way of modeling. Um, SketchUp is kind of a hybrid of the two. It acts kind of like they're solids, but not really. Uh, but Rhino is just a series of surfaces that are joined and closed. And I'll walk through kind of how you make sure you have that a little bit later when we get to the 3D printing section. Oh, oh! if you want to see them like this, uh, you're in wireframe mode. If you, right here where it says perspective, you can jump down. You were in this mode. You can jump down into shaded mode. And we may jump all the way down into rendered mode a little bit later. For right now, stay in shader, shaded mode, though. OK, so I have, I have um, these five objects set up. But in order to get a decent quality rendering, there's a few things in the scene that we kind of need to, to set up for, for long-term um, implications. And I'll do that 
uh, in a second, but we're also going to follow V-Ray 8.1. So you guys remember I have all these uh, tutorials written out. So if we come down to V-Ray 8.1, this walks through a lot of the basic default settings that are available to us in V-Ray. I'm going to walk through them so you don't have to follow through this. You can just follow along with me. The truth is that the defaults are usually set correctly anyway, but it doesn't hurt to check. So you should have your V-Ray toolbars loaded up. Hopefully those stuck on all your computers so you don't have to worry about finding this in the menu structure. If you have your toolbars available, you're going to click the yellow tag with the O on it. That's the V-Ray options tag. If you're not seeing that, you can get to it through the V-Ray menu, and then you can choose options. Either way, we'll get you to the same menu. And that brings up the V-Ray option editor. And on its surface, it doesn't look too bad um, because all of the drawers are closed. So if we look at global switches here, we can click on global switches, and we get a set of options that expands out that are our global switches. You'll see quickly why these are in little drawers, because if all of this was open, you'd have an almost endless scrolling list of options with little tiny settings. So it's a pretty overwhelming thing to start looking at. We're going to start with just that global switches, though, for now. Um, and if anything else is open, you can close it down. Sorry, I accidentally opened up a few others. Here we go, global switches. So we'll start first with geometry. Okay, we want our displacement set on. Um, we don't need to worry about the face back, so our defaults here are just fine. Lighting, we do want our lights on. We don't have any lights yet, but we will have some lights, so we'll leave those on. This hidden light option is, do you want to have your lights, even if they're hidden, light the scene? And I usually leave that set to no, because you might have a light on a layer, and you turn the layer off, and you don't want that light anymore. So usually, if the layer's on with the light on it, it shines. If it's off, it doesn't shine. That's a good way of doing it. Um, we don't need our default lights because we're going to install real lights. Hold on one second. Uh, but we do want shadows being cast. So we turn our shadows on. And we also don't want show GI only. GI stands for global illumination. And this is the kind of light that is not from a source. It's just kind of ambient lighting. So in, the world, uh, in our world, if it was an overcast day and we couldn't see the sun and we didn't have a point of light, it's still light. We can still see. It's kind of just ambient glow. We could choose to just have ambient glow without a sun if we wanted to. Yeah, hello. Uh, it's, it's this little O. Yeah, what if it doesn't pop up? Uh, you may have something else open or, or another dialog that's blocking it. I'll come over and, and, uh, and check with you in a little bit. Okay. Um, look behind, minimize your Rhino and see if there's another dialog box behind Rhino somehow. Huh. Okay. Yeah, give me, give me. Okay, so continuing on, um, indirect illumination, don't render final image. Obviously, we want the final image, so we'll, we'll leave that unchecked. Uh, the miscellaneous low thread priority, that's not a bad idea. Um, it just makes it not, if you're doing something else on the computer, you're not going to consume all your computer's resources. We're not doing any batch rendering right now. Uh, and yes, we of course want the progress window. In this category over here, we've got our materials. And this is, do we want our materials on and do we want certain properties of the materials turned on? Uh, so if you're having a problem with the material or you're having a problem with the rendering, you can try to diagnose what the problem is by unchecking a few of these. So do we want reflections to show up? Yes. Um, these default values are just fine. As we come down here, there's a few other things that won't make any sense to you just yet, but we'll leave the defaults on. Notice that all of them are on except for the override materials. Override materials is I'm having trouble and I want everything to turn out gray. Just override it with a color. Let me see if the rendering will come out. Um, so we'll leave that unchecked. And ray chasing, uh, we'll leave that as the default options. So you'll see that I didn't really change anything in this setup, but I went through so that you guys were aware that these options exist. And we'll come back and show a few more of the options a little bit later on. So I'll go ahead and close that for now. And now we need to do a few other things to get this scene to actually uh, render correctly. Right now, there is no ground. So if I was to do a rendering, and I'm going to do one, you don't have to do it. My objects will show up, but they'll show up 
on a black background because there's nothing down on the ground to show. Uh, and so I need to put a ground in. And I could just create a surface. I could come in here and create a surface and give myself a little ground and then I could render. And oh, okay, well I have a ground but it doesn't, doesn't go off to infinity. So V-Ray introduced something called an infinite plane. And this infinite plane looks kind of like a large rectangular surface, but it actually goes all the way to where the horizon line would be. So it's a special surface. It's available uh, in the V-Ray tools. If you come over, there's a kind of a diagonal plane looking thing with four arrows going off to any side, right next to the, um, the two render buttons. And it says, add V-Ray infinite plane. If I click on this, it will create this V-Ray infinite plane for me. Uh, if you don't have the toolbars, uh, the key command is viz infinite plane. And you can have it show up. And so if I zoom out, you see that it's showing me this infinite plane as a big square. But if I were to do a render right now, it would be as if that square went off to infinity. So we have a, a set size so that we can manipulate it, but it keeps going in all directions. So now that I have that infinite plane, I have a ground to my scene. So I don't have anything, um, I don't have uh, my objects just floating in space. I can, however, tell that my, my donut here is below, half of it is below the ground. So I may find that I want to move it up a little bit. So I'm going to move it in this right view so that it's up on the ground. There we go, like that. So I have my objects arrayed here. The next piece of the puzzle is I really need there to be some kind of a light in the scene. How can you move it above the ground? If you, if you have something that's below the ground, yeah. move it in the side view. So I moved it in the right view here. How and you can actually, you, if you're in perspective, double click on perspective. And that'll see all four views at once. Um, because we're not concerned with accuracy here, you can actually click the, the shape and just drag to move it. That's, that's fine. OK, so I'm going to go back into perspective here. And the next piece is I need some kind of a light in the scene. And long term, we're going to put in environments. We're going to put in sun that's tied to a specific geographic location and a specific time of day, date, year, all of that sort of thing. But for our purposes now, we just need some basic light. Nothing too fancy. So I'm going to create something called a directional light, which is the most basic light that's available in Rhino. There's a tutorial for it. It's uh, Rhino 5.17. Um, and for me, the easiest kind of way of setting this up is to create a cube first. So I'll use a box first. And I'm going to use this box kind of as a guide. So there's my box. Then I'll create the basic directional light. Now here's a good old V-Ray problem. V-Ray has issues occasionally. And that is that the directional light is actually an invisible button at the end of your light toolbar. There's no icon on it. So if you scroll through all your lights, it starts with sun, and then you get rectangular light, and you get point light, and you keep going along, you'll get to a point where there's, there's a button with no icon. And that's the directional light. Sorry. So we'll click on that, and it will give you the directional light. You can also type in directional light if you want to. Yeah. I'll help you load it later. Type in directional light, and you'll get it. So if you're missing the toolbar, and you don't have the invisible button, uh, type in directional light, and you'll get the same thing. OK? And now when I have the directional light, I'm going to, it says end of light direction vector. I'm going to put it at this corner of my cube right there. And then it says start of directional light vector. And I'll snap to the opposite corner, so diagonal across my cube. And it gives me a light that's pointed down toward my objects. The proportions don't really matter. We just need a light. If I didn't have the cube, which I'm going to delete in a second, and I came in to create the directional light, I could say, oh, there's the end. And I could say, oh, you know, I think that's going to look really good, except that it's flat against the ground. So I then need to go in and manipulate the light and rotate it up and get it to shine down. So it's really hard to, to
to put this into space uh, without some kind of a little guide, which is why I like the box. So if you put the box in, then you can do it. Otherwise, uh, probably the easiest way of doing it would be to place your light, and then with your light, turn on your edit points. Well, let's see, it's this one. There we go. And then I could move this one. You can see this is taking way too long. Move, vertical, and we'll pull that up. And now it's shining down. It's too much work. So create the box first. Go corner to corner. Makes your life easy. You still get a basic directional light. So the position of the box doesn't matter, right? It's a diagonal. It's a diagonal. Okay. It's, it's just an diagonal. easy way of getting a diagonal. So if, right. if I was doing it and my box wasn't so high, you know, let's say I did it more like yeah. that, or even if I did it where my box was long, that would work fine. I would be creating the same directional light from one corner to the other corner. And that would be, you know, earlier in the day. It would be more morning or late afternoon. This one might be, you know, a little bit higher, etc. We only need one. I've done, I've done a bunch as illustrations, but you really only need one. The other thing is for directional light, I'm going to go ahead and delete that helper. It doesn't matter where it is. It's uniform light all coming from one direction, ending at another direction. So this could be much further away from my objects. That would be fine. It could be right on top of my objects. That would be fine. It's just a symbol that represents an infinite number of light cut rays coming in parallel to my, to my work. So it's not, it's not uh, dependent on how far away it is. There will be other lights that we'll use later in the semester that matter, the setup, how far away they are from an, an existing object will affect the light. This won't. It's just directional light from one direction to another. So I have my light installed. I have my infinite plane installed. It wouldn't hurt at this point to get a little bit more organized. So I'm going to come over to my layers palette. This actually isn't written in uh, part one, but I'm, I'm showing it to you anyway. Uh, and I'll use one of my layers. We'll use uh, layer two here as my infinite plane. So let me change the object layer to be on layer two. And I could also rename this to be infinite plane. Generally, as we go forward, I'm going to call it IP instead of infinite plane, but it doesn't matter. We can put my directional light onto its own layer. So I'll change the object layer here. And we can call this directional light. I just put it onto layer three. So I, I took, instead of these, the infinite plane and the directional light being on the default layer, I made their own layers, which allows me to turn them on and off individually should I want to. It also allows me on the infinite plane to lock the infinite plane so I can't select it and manipulate it, which long term is a good idea because you'll come in and try to select something and you'll accidentally move the infinite plane. So you lock the infinite plane, you don't have to worry about that anymore. So now I need to set up kind of a, a view that I want to be doing renderings from. And I would encourage you today to have a view that's a little bit bird's eye. So we're looking down, not seeing the horizon out here. Um, if I were to render where I'm seeing the horizon, the sky currently, because we have no system in place, is black. So it's not going to help too much. <laughs> so instead, raise yourself up so you're looking down at your objects a little bit more. Make sure you can see your objects. And yeah, something like that works fine. I know that these are really blown out right now. The exposure is blown out. As soon as we put materials on, we're not going to have that problem anymore. So with this saved, or excuse me, with this scene set up the way I want it to, I'm actually going to save the scene, which is Rhino 5.28. And I used to save this and talk about saving scenes later on in the semester. But I found that if I tell you about this earlier, it can be helpful. So I'm telling you about it now. Um, this is like a saved scene in, in SketchUp where you can go back to the same scene again and again. I'm going to do that by clicking the little down arrow next to Perspective. I'll come down to Set View and then Named Views. That brings up this little Named Views dialog box here. And I'll go ahead and click the disk, the Save Disk. And I can call this, uh, I'll call it render one. And click OK. That then saves render one as my view. 
The advantage here is, oh, you know, I want to look over and let me, let me make some adjustments. And you know, when I want to go back to that same rendering, I can always come back to this triangle, go to set view, and it's now listed, render one, and it'll snap me back to that render one view. So when we get further on in the semester and you're doing repeat renderings over and over again, and you've, you've set up this perfect view, you've worked on the camera, you've got it all set, you want to save that view because you'll go back and make changes and you'll re-render the same image over and over and over again as you make your changes. So it's a really valuable thing to get in the habit of doing before you do a render. So I've saved my view, it's all set up for me, now it's time to start working in V-Ray and creating some materials. So I'm going to skip over, or I'm going to finish up part one, now it's time for part two. And I'm going to start with V-Ray 8.2 which is assigning basic materials to my objects. Actually, you know what, I'll skip over that and we'll start with 8.3 because I'm going to create the materials instead of using the default. So we've already been into the V-Ray options, which is the O here. We're going to move over one into the V-Ray material editor. If you're not seeing the toolbars, you can access it from the V-Ray menu and you'll go to material editor, either one. So it's the M or it's the uh, V-Ray Material Editor. By default, it opens up in the upper left corner. Go ahead and drag that down a bit, which uncovers your, your save commands in Rhino. So if V-Ray happens to crash, you still have access to your Rhino. So now it's here. Um, looks like I have some materials that loaded by default. Let me get rid of those materials so that mine should look like yours now. In this V-Ray Material Editor, We've got a box with an X in it. This is the preview of the current material. There's no material selected, therefore there's no preview of it. We also have a materials list that says seen materials and then nothing because we don't have any materials yet. So if I want to create a material from scratch, I will right click on seen materials. And when I do that, you'll see a, a, a menu that comes up that says create material. And I'm gonna choose standard. There are several types of materials that are available to you. For our purposes, actually for most of the semester, the only material we're gonna really worry about is standard. So I'll go ahead and click on standard. And you'll see that under scene materials now, I have a material listed. So it's listed as default material. And it's also given me a bunch of properties here on the right side. And this works just like the other set of V-Ray where there's a series of drawers available to me. Uh, usually these are open by default in a material versus closed by default in your options. So I'm going to rename my default material and I'll rename it to be red. I'll start with red. I'm just picking random colors. If you want to do different colors, you can do different colors. You don't have to do my same colors. I'll rename it red and you'll now see that it says scene materials and then red is my material. If I were to click this preview button, we get a preview of what my material looks like. Currently, it's the default gray color. We see that default gray color on a checkerboard background for contrast, so you can kind of see what's happening with that particular material. So this is about as basic as it gets. If I were to apply this material to all of my uh, objects right now, let me go ahead and select them. Don't worry, I'm going to go through this in, in detail here. If I were to do that and then render, everything would show up as a basic gray shape. Let me go back to my V-Ray options here. Oh, excuse me, my material editor, the M. So this material was red. I'd like to change this material to be red. So over in my options here, I have a drawer called diffuse. And what diffuse means is the basic color of the object or the basic image that represents the object. So it's not about gloss or shine or transparency or anything else. It's about, this is the basic color. So under diffuse, I'm going to change where it says color. It's currently gray. If I click on the gray, I can pick any one of another set of colors. I could also pick my own colors. I could type in an RGB value or a hue and saturation value, either one would get me uh, to a particular color. I'm just going to pick red, right? And I'll say OK. And now that this is set as red, if I were to preview 
my material, it would no longer be gray, it would be red. Furthermore, if I went to render, remember all these objects have the red applied to it, if I went to render my shapes, they would all turn out red because I've edited the material. So let me say that that one's red. I'm not going to change anything else, but I'm going to create a few more materials. I'm actually going to create five in total. I'll right click, I'll say create material, and I'll click standard. Remember, repetition is a good thing at this point. And so my next material maybe should be blue. And I'll say okay. I double clicked or I right clicked and said rename material. So let's me rename blue. I'll change my diffuse color to be blue. There it is. And I might go a little lighter blue. Let's go maybe like that. Okay. There's my blue. If I were to preview it, there's my blue. I want to assign that blue to one of these shapes. So each shape is going to have, there's five shapes, each shape is going to have a different material, uh, thereby a different color. So let's make this shape my blue. And you can pick any of the shapes, it doesn't matter. I'm going to right click on blue and say apply material to selection. So that's how we're going to assign materials today. So we select the object first, we go up to the material editor, we right click on the material and we say apply material to selection. Long term, we're probably going to be applying materials to layers rather than to selection because it's a broader stroke. Put all of the concrete walls on the concrete layer and then apply concrete to the layer as opposed to the individual blocks that make up the wall. So we're going to apply to selection today though. So it's now on the, the selection there. I'm going to right click on scene materials and make another material. Create material standard. This one. I'll pick my color first because I don't know what color I'm going to pick. Uh, purple, why not? So there's purple. Call this purple. I can preview it. Yep, looks like it's purple. And we can apply it to the donut. Apply material to selection. So if you're struggling to remember what your materials, where they went and what they look like, you can actually switch from your, your shaded view, which is what we're currently in, to the next one down, which is rendered. And if you're in the rendered view, you'll see a preview of what your, your materials look like. It's important, though, to understand that the rendered uh, preview is not too accurate to what the final rendering is going to be. It has a lot of really stripped down lighting effects to it. So it's not nearly as good as the final rendering. So don't ever trust that this is what it's going to look like. All right, so let me keep going. I'll go back into my materials. I'll create another standard material. And let's see, this one we will pick gold. Sure, why not? Or orange. Let's do orange. So let me rename this to be orange. And I'll apply it to the pyramid. There we go. Uh, I need one more material. Let's go standard. This will be green. Okay. By the way, there's a lot more colors as you go down that you can pick from if you don't want to pick one of your own. We'll pick dark green here. And I want to apply it to this last one. Apply material to selection. So now I have each object has a different material applied to it. And I've created that material each time. So each one has a different color. At this point, it's worth saving our work just in case something were to happen and we'd, we'd crash the computer. I'll go to File and then Save. I'm going to save the Rhino file. So today we're in 204. Let me get a folder for today here. And this is um, 204. And I'll go ahead and click Save. So now I have a saved Rhino file. That's always a good place to start. Then we'll go ahead and do a rendering. I'll click on the R for render. I could go up uh, and click on this blue sphere. I could also go up to render and then render. Any of those would work. I could type in render. So there's lots of ways of accessing render. I'll go ahead and access the render. 
and we'll go ahead and do the rendering. When it's complete, I'm going to save this rendering. So I'll click the little disk icon to save the rendering. And I'm going to save it into my flash drive, into today's folder. And I'm just going to call it image one. Save. OK, so we've made it through uh, step seven. The next thing that we're going to do in step eight is we're going to adjust the transparency of two of the objects. I'm sorry, how do you save the rendering? Okay, so rendered. once you've rendered and you're in this V-Ray frame buffer, right in the center there, there's like a diskette. Oh. Not that anybody knows what a diskette is anymore. I mean, it's been mm -hmm. ages yeah, I, since anybody yeah. ever used one. But um, that's the universal save icon now, so whatever. Anybody remember like the old five and a quarter big ones? Yeah. Totally. Three. Yeah, there's a, and you flip the little, anyway, I'm dating three? myself. Three and a half? I don't remember the three and a half. The IBM Pre is a song. Yeah. Song. Yeah, they're flat. <laughs> they're flat. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, amazing. on we go. Next thing we're going to do is adjust the transparency of two of these objects. You can pick any of the two objects that you want. We don't select the object anymore because the material's already been applied to the object. Instead, we'll just go to my material editor and we'll adjust the properties here. So if I wanted to adjust the purple, for example, I would just click on the purple and I'm going to look here again under the diffuse drawer and on the other side from color, I get something called transparency. And transparency, or the value of transparency, is represented on a scale from black to white. So black is completely opaque, white is completely transparent. And I always get these mixed up because in Photoshop it's the opposite when you're doing a mask. So go figure. But for our purposes, black is going to be transparent, or black is going to be solid, white is going to be transparent. If I click on the color, I could pick one of these other values. So the first one I'm going to do is dark gray. There are, by the way, a whole series of grays down at the bottom if you wanted a finer control. But we'll jump to dark gray. And I'll say OK. And now if I hit the preview icon here, we'd see that my shape becomes somewhat transparent. I can see through the purple to the checkerboard pattern beyond. Yeah? I'm not. Did it show up earlier, or it's not? It still hasn't shown up. Sa save your Rhino file, close it, open Rhino again, and see if you can get it. If not, I'll come and help you. You're still not working. Okay. If if it doesn't show, we'll figure it out. Okay. So I have purple. It's the dark gray, so it's semi-transparent. Let me pick another one of the shapes. Let's do the green cylinder. I'll go to green here. And under transparency, this time, instead of picking um, the dark gray, I'm going to pick gray. Light gray will make it almost impossible to see. So I think we'll go with gray. And I'll say OK. We can click Preview, and we can get a sense for what it is. It's pretty transparent at gray. You don't have to go to light gray. Light gray is very, very transparent. So now, if I come back and I render my results, We can see that my shapes have become transparent, which is the idea. At this point, I'll go ahead and save this as well. So I'll click the Save icon. This is Image 2. And I'll click Save. The cylinder, the green cylinder, though, see this, this bottom of the green cylinder? See how it has that kind of checker pattern to it, that noisy pattern? The reason we're getting that is because this cylinder is intersecting with the ground plane. And so when you have two surfaces that are exactly coplanar in the world of V-Ray, you get this noise that happens. So I'm actually going to go back and make a slight adjustment and go out of my render one. I'm going to look in my right view. I'm going to take the cylinder, and I'm going to move it up just a bit. It doesn't have to be much, just a little bit of a gap. And now when I come back to the render here and I do the render, <laughs> we 
we won't get that artifacting anymore. Okay, it's just when they're coplanar. It's either up a little bit or down a little bit. So I have those done. I have my transparency done. I'm saving those. They'll be image two. And I'll say yes. And we've finished step eight. We're going to move on into step nine, which is where we're going to add reflections to the materials. So, so far, the materials that we've created are just matte finish. There's no shine to them at all. We're going to add some shine to these materials. And I'm asking you to do it to four of the five materials, and then we'll create a rendering. So to do that, I'll start with my first object. We'll, we'll pick the, uh, the donut. Actually, I don't have to click the donut. I can go right into my material editor and adjust purple. Now, when I'm here in purple, I need to add reflection. There isn't reflection listed yet in my materials. So I'm going to right click on purple and say create layer reflection. And when I create that reflection layer, it's going to add another little drawer for me. So there's reflection. Uh, the reflection is currently set to something uh, called a Fresnel IOR value. It's a text Fresnel with an IOR, IOR value of 1.55. That's the default. We'll talk about this in the next step, though. So you don't have to worry about what the settings are just yet. When you create the reflection, it will automatically do that for you. So we've created that. If I were to preview my object, we'll suddenly see that it has a little bit of shine to it. Let me go ahead and do it for the uh, three more of these objects. We'll go with the blue object here, create layer, reflection. We'll go with the orange object, create layer, reflection. And we'll go with the red object, create layer, reflection. And on each one of these, they become shiny. I'll close my V-Ray material editor and perform another rendering. You'll notice that as soon as we add the reflection, it takes a lot longer for V-Ray to do the rendering. So suddenly the speed goes down because it's calculating how light is passing and reflecting off of one another. So not only in this example are we getting a reflection of the pyramid in the blue wall, but we're getting a reflection of the um, purple donut that's reflecting off of the yellow pyramid into the blue wall. So we're getting reflections upon reflections. That's part of what V-Ray is so good at doing. Yeah? Say that one more time. So in the layer, the color layer that we have, mm -hmm. and then we want to add another, another uh, like grayscale or transparency or anything like that, we just go apply the material to select. You don't have to apply it anymore. Once the material is applied, let's say I've applied the blue material to something. Mm -hmm. At that point, that material and all ch future changes that you make to that material will always apply to that object. Once it's associated once, you don't ever have to apply the material again, even if you make changes to the material. If you haven't assigned the object to a material yet, you will select the object. You'll right click on the material and say, apply material to selection. Well, my question is, give a second uh, within that same layer, so we see where it's creating the layer. Okay, if, if I haven't answered it, don't worry, we'll, we'll come back to it or I'll sit with you and we'll, we'll sort it out. So now I have reflection on four of those five layers. Of those four, I'm moving on to step 10, I want you to adjust the value for Fresnel IOR. Let me save this first. This should be image three. Save. So if I go back into my materials, I'm going to pick one of the objects. I'll start with the purple one again. And so I told you that in the reflection drawer, under general, we have the reflection IOR, or index of refraction of this particular material. I can access that by clicking the blue button with the capital M on it. And you will see right there, it's listed as IOR. And it's set to 
five five. Now this probably means nothing to you, okay? But what this does is it has to do with basically how shiny is the object. How shiny should that object be? And this is a default. 1.55 is a default. If you don't know, let's say we were trying to create something like a diamond, for example. If you don't know what the index of refraction for a diamond is, you can actually Google what's the index of refraction for a diamond. Um, if you do a Google search for index of refraction tables, there's a bunch of lists of different tables. Here's one from the um, CG Society. And you can look down here, and if I want a diamond, well, they don't have diamond on this one, so I'd have to do it. But there's crystal, for example. Crystal is listed at 2.0. Oh, there's diamond. See? There's diamond. 2.417 is how shiny a diamond is, essentially. So I can go in, and I can change this purple to 2.417. Four one seven, and it's going to mimic the shininess of a diamond. Yeah. So I'll come back to it. I'll do it again for the next one. So let's say I want to change it for the red shape this time. Reflection is showing, and under this reflection, there's an M. It should be a capital M that's blue. If I click on that, it brings up my index of refraction value there. So if I wanted it to be super shiny, we could go up to maybe 6 or 8. And if I were to preview it, you can see that this is almost like a red chrome. It's like really shiny, like a mirror. So I'll do that one. Let's go to the uh, orange. Here's the orange one. I'm going to click the M. And this time, instead of 1.55, I'm going to do like maybe 0.75. So I'm decreasing it. And I'll say OK. And you'll see that this has a dull shine to it, more like a plastic. So these values certainly have um, real life values, depending on what you're trying to create. Now, there's a lot of things in here, like sodium chloride. I don't know why I'd be rendering sodium chloride. Okay, So there's a lot of things in here, it's like, it doesn't, it doesn't do much to me. Okay, But there are some other things that are kind of interesting. And you might be interested in using some of those. Let's say you wanted to create a blue topaz. Well, in knowing what the index of refraction of that would be is kind of an interesting idea. So it works for some things. It's important for some things. It's not so important for other things. And again, this is if you were creating a material completely from scratch. Okay? So they exist. You can do a Google search and, and find this kind of information if you're interested. So let me go back. And I've done that at 0.75 for this. It's, it's a little bit more dull. That was three of the four shiny materials. I'll go ahead and click the Render button again. And you'll notice that the render slows down even more. So each time you add something, add some complexity to the rendering, it gets a little bit slower. All right, so there's that version. I'll go ahead and click Save. And this is now image four. So you notice after each time I'm saving the image, because we're going to ultimately post all of them. OK, so I've made it down to that. Um, the last thing that I can do is to change the reflection glossiness <coughs> on one of the, the objects. And this is more changing the finish than it is the actual amount of reflection. Uh, it's available. I'll do it for, I'll do it for the blue shape here. Uh, if I click on the M, oh, excuse me, never mind, I don't have to do that. It's right here under glossiness. There's the reflection glossiness. I could do it at 0.5, for example. If I preview it, you can see that it has a little bit of shine, but not too much. Let me preview it so you can see it with one. There it is with its shine on it. If I go down to 0.75, you can see that the reflection is more blurry, as if there was a texture on the object. If I go all the way down to 0.5, you can't even distinguish that little rectangular light reflection. So it's dropping down. It's got reflection, but it's not too much. So let me leave this one at 0.75. 
There we go. So we see a little bit of a blurry reflection. Let me change the orange one to be 0.5. There it is. And we'll go ahead and render one last time. So the idea behind doing all these renderings is so that you can start to see how different changes, different settings adjust what the materials look like. And so in this example, you can see that we're still getting a reflection. You can see the reflections in here, but it's not nearly as clear. And so this became less of a shiny material and more of a matte material, like a plastic or something like that. I'll go ahead and save this one as well. This will be image five. And we'll click Save. Now we've gone through and we've created these materials from scratch, which is the first kind of big thing that I want you to work through. The truth is, though, a lot of times we're not going to spend the effort to create the material from scratch. We're instead just going to load up a material of some kind. And so I have for you all a pack of materials that you can download that have a bunch of generic materials in them that you can start to pick from. And so today I'm going to have you all go to the website and I'm going to have you download these materials. Um, and like I said, I'm in the process of updating a few of them, so I may have you re-download them later in the semester. But for right now, this will get you started. It's under Resources, Downloadable Resource Packages. You have to be logged in to get this. And if you look under the Archie 136 section, there's a Download Zip Archive of V-Ray Materials. If you click on that, it will take you to a Dropbox link. It'll ask you to sign up, and you can just close that because you don't need to sign up. And from there, you'll get a button to download. And you can choose Direct Download instead of saving to your Dropbox. The Direct Download will start the download process. The reason that it's hosted by Dropbox is I think the download happens a little bit faster coming from them than it does from my server. Uh, so you'll download it. Um, it looks like it, it, the zip file is about 120 megabytes, so it'll take a few minutes to come down. When you're done, you need to extract that zip file onto your flash drive so that it, it exists not compressed on your flash drive. I should already have it on my OneDrive if it's synced up for me. Yep, good. So I'll be able to do it. I have it inside a folder called Resources, V-Ray, and then it's my V-Ray materials. So, what we can do is we can actually apply these materials to the various shapes that I have. So I'll go into my V-Ray editor, and I'm going to show you how to load up materials. So, so far we have blue, green, orange, purple, and red. If I want one that's not from scratch, I'll right click on Seam Materials, and instead of saying Create Material, I'll come one down and say Load Material. And when I pick Load Material, I can then go to my flash drive, and for me, it's under Resources, V-Ray, V-Ray Materials. And you'll see that I have a bunch that are, that are kind of categorized here. So if you wanted brick, for example, you could double click on brick. And there's a couple different bricks that are available to you. Maybe the old dirty brick. Sure, I'll take the old dirty brick. When you double click on the file, you'll get to a file called a vismat. The vismat is the material file that V-Ray is looking for that will load the material. It contains all the settings for you. You do, however, need more than just the vismat for the material to work properly. So if I actually looked at my flash drive and I looked in my V-Ray materials folder and I looked in brick and I looked inside the uh, old dirty brick right here, we'd see that I have the old dirty vismat, but I also have a bunch of other things. Like there's a file called brick01 and 01b and 01s and whatever. Those are all referenced files that are part of this material. If I were to click it, 
It's actually the picture of the brick. If I were to click and open up the brick 01B, it's a different picture of the brick. And we'll explain what all these things are and how they play together, but I need those files in addition to the vismat file. So just leave them in the same place. You really don't have to worry about it as long as you decompress it uh, and then in your open vismat file, you pick the vismat. I'll go ahead and say open. And now in my list here, I have brick, red, old, dirty. And if I look at the preview, there's that preview of my brick. I want to apply that to one of my objects. So maybe I'll select this object. I'll right click and say apply material to selection. Now I have the brick on that object. It doesn't look perfect. We're going to talk about what texture mapping is in another class. So if it doesn't look quite right, no big deal. We'll talk about how to make it look better on your objects later on. I'm going to right click on scene materials. I'm going to go to load material and I'm going to load something else. So as you come down here, you see that there's a variety of different things that you can pick from. So maybe I want porcelain. And inside of porcelain, I could pick a, um, I don't know, a red porcelain. So there's my red porcelain. If I were to preview it, there it is. I could then take my one of these objects. I could right click and say apply material to selection. Now that one has red porcelain on it. I'm going to keep going and load in five materials. So I'll load, let's see here. Let me go into metal and let me load up core 10. That's that rusty steel. And I'll say okay. If I look at core 10, there it is as it's rusty steel. Let's apply that to this. I'll right click and say apply material to selection. And that's become core 10. Let me load material. There's even some landscape materials in here. So I have some dirt, I have some gravels. I have, I have a variety of, I have sand for example. I have asphalt if we wanted to do that. There's even some grass. So I could do the grass with flowers. For example, this is not going to turn out the best in the world, but I'll do it anyway for the fun of it. And on the grass with flowers, let's put the glass with, with flowers on the cylinder here. Apply material to selection. There it is. There's the grass. If I were to zoom in, you can see the grass there. <laughs> and I could load, I don't know. Uh, let's load a fabric. Sure, why not? Uh, there's a bunch of different fabrics in here. Let's go dark gray bedding. Sure, why not? I don't even know what dark gray bedding looks like, but let's take a look. Let me preview it. Yeah, it looks like dark gray bedding. Um, let me apply that to this square like that. Now I can go ahead and I can render this view with these materials. So I'll click on render. And chances are the render is going to take longer than the renders I've been doing because the materials have different properties to them. So we'll let that finish. So you're going to work through five materials and you're going to import them into your current scene and you're going to save that final result. And then the last part is to open your file from last class, that house, and apply a material to your house and render that. So I'm going to leave that one to you to sort through how to do it. Okay. When we go to post the images, I'm going to click on save. I'm happy to help you do this post part, but those of you that were in 135, remember how sometimes we posted a gallery where it was a little slideshow of pictures? It would be nice if it was that way. Um, if you go to the course website and you make your post, I'm going to go to new post. This is exercise 204. I'm going to categorize it as exercise 204. Oops. Exercise 204. Now, this one, um, they're, they're the back of your sheet today has the instructions. So everything I'm going through has the sh instructions on it. Okay. So um, I have that set up. I'm going to come over here under Format, which is right below the Publish button, and I'm going to choose Gallery from that list. As soon as I choose gallery, this little icon for slideshow on post page shows up below my content area. I want to turn that on. So I'll get a slideshow this time. Then I'll go to the gallery tab right up here by content, gallery tab. 
and I'm going to click on Insert Gallery or Add Images. I'll click Select Files, and I can actually upload all of these at once. So let me go into Today is 204, and here's my spring. I'm going to take Image 1 through 6 right there. You'll have one more. You'll have a seventh because you do that, the house. And I'll click on Open. It will then run through all of these. And for those of you that were in 135 where this took forever, these renderings are so small it should do it really fast. So I wouldn't worry about it. When I'm done, I'll click Save All Changes. Then I'll click this little X in the upper right corner. Last thing is I have to set a featured image. I'll scroll all the way to the bottom, click on Set Featured Image. And I'll pick one of these, doesn't matter which one you pick, and click Set Featured Image. There it is. I'll scroll back up to the very top, and I'll click the Publish icon. Notice that in this whole process, I didn't actually put any content into the content area. So it's still blank in the content area. When it's done and you click View Post, you will see a slideshow with all of your images. Just makes it easier for people to, to scroll through. If you struggle with that, don't worry. I'll help you through it. It's not a, not a big deal. Worst case is we just have all the images in your post, and, and we'll do it that way. OK, so I'm going to let you guys go, start working on these materials. Hopefully, you're able to follow along with a fair amount of it already. Uh, but of course, I'll float around and help you uh, if you get stuck. Quickly. Question for everybody or a question for just you? OK. Let me, let me stop this and save it.